The Lionel Gelber Prize is awarded every year to the best book on international affairs. To mark the 25th anniversary, we spoke with five Gelber winners. I asked them how the world has changed. My name is John Stackhouse, and here is what I learned. We're at the University of California at Berkeley, and I'm joined by Adam Hochschild, author of King Leopold's Ghost, a winner of the Gelber Prize. Adam, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to do so. I'd like to start by looking back at the spread of human rights through the 20th century. Of course, many of the foundation stones were laid in the Congo and in the, uh, the Congo movement that you describe in King Leopold's Ghost. Uh, institutions and laws created through the uh, 20th century and a lot of optimism in the 1990s about the establishment of uh, global norms on uh, on human rights. Do you believe that there was hope then or was it a false hope? Well, when you look at the whole history of human rights, um, I think there have always been uh, times when people have felt hopeful and times when people have felt discouraged. And we go back and forth between the two. And like most good ideas, the idea of human rights was one that was built in increments. It never burst into being at one point in time. You know, you go back a couple of centuries and you find philosophers like John Locke, who, you know, was one of the first people to talk about the idea that government should arise from the consent of the governed, but he owned stock in a slave trading company. So we can say he wasn't applying his own ideas of human rights very fully. Uh, and people centuries from now may make the same kind of judgment about us. But it's fascinating to me to look at how these ideas have been added to over time. Similarly, if we jump ahead to the colonial era in Africa, uh, in some ways the first great human rights movement of the 20th century was the movement to expose the atrocities in King Leopold's Congo. Uh, they were exposed, people were passionate about this, but it hadn't yet really occurred to people in Europe or North America that uh, maybe people living in places like Africa were also entitled to the rights of citizenship. It was clear that you know, people were outraged that um, Africans were being made into slave laborers and treated very badly. But the idea of full citizenship ending colonialism was yet another leap forward that didn't come for almost another you know, three quarters of a century after that. So these things happen in stages. So much of what you're describing is really the, the challenge of universality of, uh, of human rights, which was largely accepted through the 20th century, yet continues to be debated and tested in different parts of the world, whether it's uh, Afghanistan, uh, especially under the Taliban, or even China today. Where do you think we're at in terms of our global acceptance of universal human rights? The idea of universality of human rights, I think, is really sort of a post-World War II phenomenon uh, with the, in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was signed on to by all kinds of authoritarian and totalitarian regimes like the Soviet Union, uh, by European countries that uh, maintained colonies uh, in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that idea that if something is a right, it applies to everybody, is a profoundly important idea. It is something where I think in figuring out how to get there, we can take inspiration from past crusades. When I look at the early British abolitionists at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, uh, the Congo reformers, uh, who are the people who exposed the uh, outrageous atrocities in King Leopold's Congo uh, around the beginning of the 20th century. I'm inspired by their uh, determination to bring their concern to as wide an audience as possible. And I'm inspired by their ceaseless quest to use new tools to do so. It was the political poster, which was something really almost unknown at that, at that uh, point but they created the first one that was widely seen and 
today we see reproductions of this poster all the time. It's that diagram of a slave ship seen from the top down where you can see all the slaves' bodies, how tightly they're packed in there. That was created by a local abolitionist committee in the port of Plymouth in 1788. Uh, it had a revolutionary effect when it was seen. This was the days before photography, before video. Um, as soon as the abolitionists realized what a powerful tool this was, they ran off 8,000 copies and put them up in pubs all over England. That was one new medium of the day that they used. Another was they came up with the first logo that I know of that was ever specifically designed for a political organization. It showed the image of a kneeling slave in chains surrounded by the legend, am I not a man and a brother? When women abolitionists got into the act, they came up with one with a woman slave in chains and the legend, am I not a woman and a sister? And this was reproduced on coat buttons, hat pins, seals for sealing wax, everywhere you could think of, first political logo. Jump a hundred years forward, you have the Congo reformers. What's the new media of the day that they're using? Uh, one of them was the magic lantern, the slide projector, uh, showing a way of showing photographic images before a large audience. This had not been done much before. Did the Congo movement suffer from an overly Eurocentric or perhaps Anglo-American-centric approach to human rights? Was there an argument perhaps in the day that, uh, while of course there may have been egregious situations, the broader issue of rights might have been interpreted differently or viewed differently in other parts of the world than it was in Britain and America of the day? I think the Congo reformers, because they were primarily British and to some extent American, in some ways ignored the abuses that their own countries were perpetrating because colonialism, even though it had a particularly uh, uh, brutal manifestation in what King Leopold II of Belgium was doing in the Congo, it was in no way limited to the Congo. And indeed, if today we look back uh, and look at the other parts of uh, you know, colonial Africa at that time, every African colony that held wild rubber, which was the cause of the real brutality and the, the exploitation in the Congo, they turned people into forced laborers to gather wild rubber and work them to death, essentially. Uh, exactly the same thing happened in the French Congo, across the Congo River from Leopold's Congo, which also had wild rubber, in the Cameroons, which at that point was owned by Germany, in northern Angola under the Portuguese. Uh, the only reason that there wasn't an equivalent death rate was that uh, the British did not have any tropical rainforest with wild rubber in it. If they had, it might well have been the same thing. As it as it was, the British, like every other nation with colonies in, in Africa, used a great deal of forced labor. So I think the movement was focused on the Congo because it was very easy to make a villain out of King Leopold II. Uh, he was an immensely uh, greedy man with, in my view, very few redeeming features. Uh, also, Belgium was a small country and politically relatively powerless. Uh, taking on France or Germany uh, or the British Empire itself would have been a much more difficult thing to do. Uh, but I think it's universal that people are always uh, more ready to condemn abuses in somebody else's country or somebody else's colony than they are in their own homeland, and that if we really care about human rights, we've got to look at these standards uh, as something universal. What sort of influence does technology have on the human rights movement both then and now? I think in some ways it has made the work of human rights activists easier in that if something terrible happens in some remote corner of the world, if somebody's there with a cell phone and can take a picture of it, it often can reach a huge audience in a very short space of time. It doesn't have to get filtered through, you know, spending months on a ship 
written record traveling somewhere and then a network of friendly people who receive it and distribute it. Technology also, of course, gives repressive governments uh, all sorts of tools to monitor their citizens' behavior. And uh, certainly here in the United States, we've seen, you know, learned all sorts of disastrous things about how our government is monitoring not just American citizens, but people in many other countries as well in ways that they should not have been doing. So technology can cut both ways, but I sure would like to see human rights activists use it to do good things with. One wonders, reading King Leopold's ghost, how is it that good people and even good nations manage to miss what is right right before them and uh, look so egregious or appalling, even horrific in, in hindsight? And we see that right through history. What, in your view, leads us to miss what is right before us? I think most people interpret what they see in terms of what everybody around them takes for granted. This is why the slavery example fascinates me so much, because there were, uh, you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands of Europeans uh, who came face to face with slavery. They worked on slave ships, they worked on slave plantations in the Americas, and so forth. Um, very, very few of them gave any sign of seeing anything that they felt was immoral. You know, these are people who went to church, considered themselves Christians, um, often followed a very high standard of morality in their dealings with uh, you know, fellow Europeans, fellow white people. But because they lived in societies which took slavery for granted, they didn't see anything unusual or outrageous about white people owning black people, black pe people being whipped, chained, treated horribly. Uh, once the anti-slavery movement introduced that idea that there was something outrageous about this, um, the idea kind of caught on. Uh, but we need to think a hundred years from now, what are people looking back at us going to judge us for? Almost all the developed countries of the world these days, the income gap is widening. Um, you know, corporate uh, chief executives are, are paid, you know, a hundred or a couple of hundred times as much as their lowest paid employees. Will people someday see this as something being almost as outrageous as slavery? Uh, will they see the fact that, you know, here in the United States, some people um, still don't have health insurance? I think we should see those things as outrageous today. In King Leopold's Ghost, you concede that there isn't enough emphasis placed on local actors, indigenous actors, and uh, this is always a challenge of history. Why is it that historians are not able or better able to position individual indigenous actors as more prominent forces in the reform movements in their own societies? That's one limitation that we have in writing history. You always find many more records of the colonized than the colonizers, of slave owners than slaves, of men than of women, of the rich than the poor, and so forth. That raises another question, which is when we tell stories of what's happening in the world today, do we focus too much on outsiders, representatives of our own culture, rather than trying to find people in the countries that we're writing about and tell things through their stories. And I think this is a problem that we do. It's, you know, any American or Canadian or European journalist who's working in a, a country in the world south knows that you're going to get more readers or viewers of a story if the story is about the uh, heroic actions of, a, of an NGO from one's own country or, you know, an attractive young doctor or social worker or whatever who has journeyed there uh, to do something good for the people there. Let's turn to the Congo of today. Why is it that it continues to fall so far behind, not the rest of the world, but the rest of sub-Saharan Africa? This is a country that's in bad shape. It's in bad shape because it's a country that is very rich in natural resources. 
everything you can think of. Uh, gold, uh, uranium, coltan, this mineral that's used in, in computer chips, uh, timber, diamonds, uh, the, list, the list is endless. It's very rich in all this stuff, uh, but it, in effect, over much of the country has no functioning government. And that's a terrible combination because that means that uh, the powers that be in a given place tend to be local warlords, um, multinational corporations, the armies of neighboring African countries, and sometimes Congo's own national army, which sort of begins acting like a warlord itself. One example from this day that I went to the gold mine, there was a village at the top of a ridge overlooking this valley, and it was about a half hour's walk down a path to the, the creek where, where there was some gold in the sand at the bed of, bed of the creek and where people were working with the same kinds of tools, picks and shovels and so on, that they used in the California gold rush in 1849. Uh, as I was walking um, down about 10 o'clock in the morning down this half hour long path to get to the mining area, I met two young Congolese guys walking up um, who uh, showed me with, with enormous pleasure a little tiny plastic baggie with sand that they had gotten that morning and you could see specks of gold uh, in it. And they were very happy that they'd found this much gold this early in the day and they were walking back up to the town at the top of the ridge to use the gold to buy breakfast. So then I went down to the mining area, talked to the miners down there, then walked back up to the village, and there were the two um, Congolese guys I'd met that morning, about to go back down to the mine to try to find enough gold so they could buy their dinner. So here are people living from literally from hand to mouth in what is in mineral terms one of the richest countries in the world, if not the richest for its land area. In conclusion, if I can ask you to look back 25 years to 1990, a period of optimism in the world. The Berlin Wall was down, communism was discredited, uh, there was great hope in, uh, in international human rights and the spread of democracy across much of the world. Are you as optimistic today as you might have been in 1990? When I look back 25 years, I do remember feeling a, a great optimism at that time. Uh, I don't feel quite as much of it today. Going back uh, 25 years, I had just um, finished writing a book about South Africa, where I spent a lot of time in the 1980s. The book came out in 1990, and then happily, some aspects of it became outdated quite quickly because of the remarkable changeover in South Africa. And the next time I went back there was in 1994 to cover the first democratic elections, which was a tremendously exciting moment. Um, I also spent the first half of 1991 living in what was then still the Soviet Union. It stopped being so by the end of that year, uh, writing a book about what was happening there. And that was certainly a time when people living in, in, in Russia and the other former Soviet territories felt optimistic that perhaps uh, a very different future uh, was in front of them. Um, certainly in terms of what's happened in the former Soviet Union, it's been very discouraging. Uh, we're now back to Russia being a sort of monarchy again and Putin is a, is a new czar. Um, South Africa, I have more hope for. Uh, I think democracy is there to stay. There are huge problems with inequalities, um, continuing economic inequalities, corruption, but they're not the only country that suffers from that kind of thing. Uh, I don't feel as optimistic about the world as a whole, I think, uh, in large part because to me, the overarching issue today is that of global warming. And we are being so slow about acting on that individually and collectively in significant ways that I think this is what we're going to be judged most harshly on when, if people are still around a couple hundred years from now, they look back at those primitive people back in 2015 and think, 
You know, well, for primitive people, they had relatively advanced science. They knew climate was changing, but they didn't do anything about it. Why do you feel humans can't collectively respond more effectively to challenges in the moment when in hindsight we see them as so obvious? Well, when I look at the world today, I see us recognizing problems, but not able to act very well about them. We have still not evolved a way of acting collectively and internationally about a problem like that. Um, you know, it's one of these things that no country can do on its own. Uh, we need international agreements. We need some sort of binding international agreements. Um, we need something like that internationally to be able to tackle problems like global warming above everything else, um, inequities in the world trading system, inequality of income. Uh, none of these things can be handled on a basis of one nation working at it at a time. And of course, some nations don't want to work at it at all. Adam Hochschild, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure.